I know some basic protocol for dealing with bears. What most people don't realize is that bears are mostly curious. They don't think about eating you until they've gotten close enough to smell you and what you've been eating. If they see, hear, smell, or otherwise sense something they don't immediately recognize, then they will investigate to see if it's edible or playable. One way or another, their curiosity keeps them on the move, and a bear will not stick around too long. That's why this one bear caught my attention. Leave it up to the kids to want to kick up their tomfoolery as soon as a bear comes around. When I was out and about making my rounds, I spotted a black bear that seemed to be eyeballing a group of teens that looked to be in the spectrum of 16 or 17, mostly too young to be out by themselves like they were. I knew their type right away when they spotted the bear and stared to engage the animal by talking to it and approaching it. I hate getting in the way of anyone's fun, but the way these kids were doing things, I was going to be forced to step in. I found myself hesitating because the bear wasn't responding the way most bears do when humans try to interact with him. It just sat there. It watched. But it didn't make any of the typical moves of a curiosity or caution. Bears will habituate to the presence of humans. But not like that. Not in a park. I used my binoculars to get a closer look at the bear before I had to rain on anybody's parade. He wasn't foaming at the mouth or twitching, but I did spot something strange. The bear looked so vacant, absent. I almost wondered if it had been getting into somebody's pharmaceuticals. The kids started throwing scraps of bread, definitely a huge no-no but the bear would so much as acknowledge the food as it bounced off its nose. The bread usually doesn't hit the ground with most bears. I breathed a sigh of relief when the kids gave up and moved along to the other side of the park. My anxiety picked right back up when the bear followed after them. My brain failed to process the fact that the animal wasn't showing any signs of stalking behavior it wasn't hiding. It wasn't crouching. It just followed like a stone dog that didn't want to be left alone. The kids got focused on a small pond and, like most careless youth, decided it was time for jumping in. The bear came to the edge of the water where the kids eyed it for a minute, but then continued what they were doing when they could tell that the bear was just going to watch. I'm normally a man of a bit more action than I was in that moment. The whole thing was too strange and surreal, and I was hesitating a bit more than usual for me. The stability of the animal and the safety of the kids hung in the balance, and I don't know if you know what teenagers will do when they realize they're busted and the folks could be getting a phone call. Such reactions in the presence of a bear won't lead to anything right. As casually as you please, the bear lowered its head to the water and began to lap. Then things got even more weird. The bear looked like it was gagging. Its tongue began to distend, as though it were horking up its own tongue from the bottom of its stomach. What I thought was a bear's tongue was actually something else. Something else that had been inside the bear, but not part of it. It was pale and had translucent ribbed flesh and shallowy veins. Its long body torqued its way out of the bear's body into the water. Other similar things moved in one large tangled mass from the bear's mouth. Of course, I didn't know what I was looking at, but my instincts told me that those kids were now in danger. Throwing all finesse to the wind, 
I ran towards them shouting. Too many of them looked at me like I was another lame adult, making a big ruckus over nothing. I tried shouting that the bear was sick and they were in danger. I think some of them saw the things that were now swimming towards them, like a swarm of water moccasins. Only worse, all but two girls made it out of the water in time. Those girls, I had never seen anything in nature do that to a human body, and the sight was an experience that I will never be able to remove from my brain without the help of a bullet. Those snake-sized worms moved through the girl's body as effortlessly as they had moved through the water. One of them was eaten up from the inside. The other one lumbered onto the bank, swollen three times her original size, and had that vacant look that the bear had had. She started to stagger in a random direction in the forest. I called out to her to remain where she was, but there was no answer. I tried to come close to handcuff her, but wriggling pale things poked through her skin to reach for me. I knew deep down inside that shooting her would be doing her a favor, but I would go to prison for the rest of my life for it. I radioed out and called for backup since the girl wasn't going to cooperate. That's when a shot had rang out, but it wasn't from my service pistol. Yes, park rangers can be armed. One of the kids had a gun and shot their stumbling friend. I thought I couldn't be freaked out anymore. I waited for the occupants to come slithering out of its body, but they didn't. They wiggled out just a few inches. I guess that they could survive outside the water. Nobody believed this kid's story, even though I corroborated as much as I could have. That same kid who mercifully shot his friend is now in prison, which this was years ago by the way. No amount of evidence, not even the body of the bear that was missing, all of its internal organs except for the bones and scant muscle tissue was enough to satisfy the court. That was enough for me. I couldn't handle the responsibility. I couldn't know what happened to those kids. I couldn't handle knowing what was inside horrible things right in the woods beside us. So, I got out of doing park ranger work for quite a long time ago. I just couldn't do it anymore. Stuff like that happens way more on a daily basis than you could ever imagine, and we're sworn not to talk about it. I'm a park ranger at the not as notorious as it used to be, Devil's Tramping Ground. That's right. When you hear of a place where the devil supposedly places in circles on the earth, why not throw up a camping site right next to it? I mean, what can go wrong? Actually, nothing has gone wrong there. There are tons of stories and local legends, but that's how people like it. They don't want the truth of the matter to be so plainly proven, and they don't want the legends to be completely solidified either. Being suspended between truth and fantasy keeps the mystery alive. Keeps kids daring each other to spend an entire night camping in the ring of barren earth, where Satan drags his feet. I'm a strict materialist, so I don't put any faith in legends, but they do make for interesting storytelling. I'm submitting this story to you because it's really eating a hole in the back of my psyche. No matter how much I try and work through it, I can't explain things in rational terms and I've always been able to explain my experiences in rational terms. I guess my angle is that you'll get a fascinating story, and I'll get to vent and maybe make some connections that I just can't while overthinking things. We used to be a huge tourist spot. Now, the campgrounds next to the Devil's Tramping Ground isn't just another hit or miss for people passing through, or wanting to get close to nature for a day or two. So, 
often I will find myself alone when I'm making my rounds, including when I pass by the actual tramping ground. If you've never seen it, you're not missing much. It's just a big circle of dirt, where nothing seems to want to grow. My patrol includes that area to make sure that there are no dangerous or sensitive objects left behind. In their quest to see the devil, people have turned to chemical assistance and left behind sharps and illegal substances that innocent passerbys could get into. The circle is completely bare more often than not. I stick around for half a minute just to get a cheap thrill of walking in the circle. This one visit went a little bit different than others. For once, I found something bigger than a syringe needle. It was a brass knife of some sort, rather old and difficult to make out. I could tell that once upon a time, it had been a very detailed carving before its features had been rubbed down with repeated handling. The hilt had a pyramid with an eye, very similar to something you'd see in Freemason artwork. I was taken aback to see such a beautiful item discarded in such a place. I was turning it over and over in my hand, rubbing dirt from the details of its carvings. When I swear on my life, everything that I own, that the eye in the pyramid blinked at me. It happened in just an instant, but I memorized the entire thing. The knife then fell from my hand to the dirt, and from that moment forward, I had that dreadful sensation that somebody was looking at me, watching me. It was a great weight, and it wouldn't move from me. I was going to leave the knife behind so that its original owner could return for it, but no sooner had I seated myself in my patrol car than my head swam, and I felt drowsy. I could vaguely hear my feet scraping against something like the ground, but it felt hazy and far away. When I opened my eyes, the knife was on the dashboard. It occurred to me that I may have had a lapse in memory, and I retrieved the knife while in a partially aware state. Why I would do such a thing was beyond me. I meant to turn it into a public lost and found, but I forgot where I was going and didn't remember until much later in the evening when it was far too late to do anything about it. I tried leaving the knife in the car when I got home. Same thing happened. I touched the door to my home. I felt dizzy and had the foggy memory of my feet crunching on the gravel in the driveway. I opened my eyes to see that I was still standing at my door, but the knife was brandished in my hand. I hadn't just gone and gotten it. I held it like I was going to attack the first person I saw when I opened my door. I spent the evening researching mental disorders and tics of behavior, trying to find out factual, rational explanations of what I was experiencing. Nothing. It wasn't long before I had to turn in my badge and bring myself in. I was a mess. I had developed paranoid schizophrenia, several forms of psychosis, and some other things seemingly overnight. I baffled the specialist that dealt with me. I had a checkup not that long ago, and everything seemed to be in the green then. They couldn't understand why I went from being alright to not being alright in such a short space of time. I told them about the knife, since I didn't feel I had anything left to lose. They didn't have anything satisfying to say. Yes, the knife was strange, but they felt that my dormant but awakening issues caused me to perceive anomalies in the knife. I almost wonder to this day if it was some sort of occultic weapon or item or possibly used for ritualistic ceremonies, like human sacrificing, but I have no idea. I have since gotten rid of it, and it still plagues me in my mind to this day. I'm writing into you about my own unique story as a park ranger. 
Let me get into that, and spare you any boring pre-details. The sky, I feel, is full of junk anymore. I saw a rainstorm blow down what was left of an old weather balloon. There was something about its size and shape that didn't strike me as quite right. But, my job as a public servant called on me to investigate. I was a park ranger, and the park that I served at is big, and the force I served on is small. I followed the weather balloon to where it may have landed, and the first thing I noticed was how the balloon seemed to be pulsating. It was moving in ways that it shouldn't be considered where the wind was coming from. I also didn't recall seeing balloons of such sickly color. It was the same color that my grandma had been when she was in hospice. The last straw was when the thing started reaching for me with actual tentacles. I probably lost my credibility at this point, but I swear, the thing lashed out at me with moving, writhing appendages. I wasn't going to waste time asking questions. I drew my gun and shot. The arms fell off almost, though they did flail around. I made an educated guess as to where a brain or similar organ might have been. My guess must have been good, because this thing immediately went limp upon a bullet. I kid you not, no more than five minutes later, Three men in a black sedan pulled up to me and told me that I had damaged government property. I proceeded to let them know their precious government property had nearly made a meal out of me and that I acted well within my own rights. As a government worker myself, it was my job to uphold this area of land. Who were they to be above me? They didn't see things that way. Afterwards, I was immediately detained and taken to an office building that I never even knew existed. I was seated in front of other strange-looking men, and they put some photos in front of me. They asked me if I had discovered the weather balloon in the pictures. I told them that I had found something that resembled a weather balloon, but was dangerous. They showed me more pictures of a weather balloon that had a single gaping hole. They told me that it was the balloon that I had come across and that I had damaged. I told them that the balloon in the pictures was lacking the tentacles that made me shoot it. It's not like me to just go around and shooting random things. I'm not trigger happy. Second, I was having a very hard time understanding just why the government would have such a big investment in a single weather balloon in the first place. They let me know that I was being relieved from duty indefinitely, and that I was lucky that I wasn't being locked up. Listen, I know this sounds like a sci-fi story, but there's some stuff that goes on that we'll never know with civilians. I've had a few friends that I'm not even sure I can talk about, but they too have been relieved of duty being park rangers for several similar experiences. Maybe not dealing with things like that. But my one, I'll give you some details. Swear he had an encounter with Greys while out in the forest. But he had a similar thing. Men showed up, detained him, asked a bunch of questions, and then was relieved of duty. That doesn't exactly explain what happened to me. But something is going on, and I strongly believe the federal government has their hands all over it whatever that is. My patrol through the campgrounds would have ended as blandly as any other patrol. At the last minute, just before it was time for me to call it a day, there was a scream from the woods that I had heard, just off the trail. Kids will holler their heads off all day long out here, but there was something about this particular scream that did sound like genuine distress. The sound led me into one of the more unkept tangles of young trees and thorny undergrowth. It sounded so close that I swore 
it would be just over the next swell of earth behind the next tree. But I guessed at the time that the acoustics of the forest had been playing with my senses. The scream seemed to always be a few paces away. It even seemed to be switching directions on me. It was distressing to me because you don't have time to burn in a real emergency. I rounded another corner and I wouldn't be here to tell you this story if I had not reacted as quickly as I did. I grabbed hold of a nearby branch and pulled myself back. The sound of the scream had led me to a ledge that dropped off into a clean fall. The weird part was that even in this hill country, elevation isn't an extreme thing. You find places to fall where you'll get hurt, but there aren't any canyons or gorges. I was staring down into a ravine that was so deep I could not see the bottom, and it made me feel dizzy. The screaming was coming from down inside that impossible, vast ravine. Then I heard a giggle, right before something pushed me from behind. My grip on that branch was the only thing that kept me from sailing out into that pit. I turned around, fighting mad, but there was nobody there. Then the screaming was gone, and the gorge was gone. The drop was suddenly no more than 20 feet. I don't know what to think, and I'm afraid to say too much about it. So, I tried to do some research. I've even looked up demonologists, paranormal investigators. I don't know where else to turn. So I'm sending this to as many people as I can. Get it out there for me. The more word you get out, the more answers I can hopefully obtain. You need many varying skills to be an effective ranger. More than you might think. Of course, the obvious stuff is you have to be pretty tough. Not minding all sorts of weather conditions or rough terrain. A love and respect for nature also goes a long way. And resilience. But also, a good sense of intuition just might save your life in the right scenario. One of the less enjoyable parts can be when we turn into search and rescue. Now you might wonder why us rangers get called in when some campers don't come home, rather than the police. Well, the cops do their part, obviously, but especially when the ground we cover is so vast. It makes sense for a ranger to go out and look in the first instant. 99 times out of 100, those campers are just lost or even just decided to stay on an extra day and forgot there would be people back home worrying. It happens all the time, but sometimes it feels off and that's when we worry. And that was what happened last year in 2019 we got a call to say that a couple of college kids had been down here doing some research and filming and hadn't made it back to their own dorm where their buddies were expecting them. They weren't answering calls despite still having service and now it had been a couple of days and people were beginning to worry. So off I go in the truck to start with and then on to foot in more inaccessible parts of the parkland where you almost actually can't see the forest for the trees. Another ranger hit the opposite side of the park and we were keeping in contact via radio. If we didn't find anything, the cops would come with dogs. I'm calling the names of the kids and thinking of every ravine and potential spot that they could have tripped or fallen down when something literally stopped me in my tracks. Have you ever seen the Blair Witch Project? The part where there are all those little weird twig things hanging in the trees. Yeah, well, that was what it was like. Nowhere near as many as in the movie, but I counted at least six, and it felt eerie there, like some sort of magic something going on. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or spooky stuff, but I do know that a messed up human being can do all sorts of crazy. 
My honest thought, right then and there, was that these kids had gotten themselves mixed up in some weird occult stuff. Wasn't that what Ramirez was into? There was no denying how quiet it was right then too. Maybe it was just because I was stomping through the brush, trying to make as much noise as possible, so the kids could hear me, and maybe any birds or critters that usually call the spot their home had hidden, wondering what this person was doing. Honestly, if Mike Flanagan wanted to come and film here, he wouldn't need to spend millions on a set. I'd been through that stretch of forest hundreds of times and had never experienced such a pronounced feeling of unease and almost dread. I nearly turned around. I almost thought there wasn't any possible way they could be here. And then I found them at the bottom of a ravine. Thankfully, this story has a happyish ending. They were both alive. I can't say alive and well for certain, as they both looked like complete hell. Like they had nearly been scared to death. Immediately, I had radioed to get a paramedic and the cops down there. One had a broken ankle. The other had suffered two broken ribs. And aside from that, superficial cuts and bruises. The hospital said that there would be no lasting damage. They also said thank God I had got to them, as they were close to hypothermia. When the cops were asking them, why hadn't they tried to get help? Why hadn't the one with the broken rib tried finding somebody? They were quiet and wide-eyed, with terrified expressions. It was chalked down to nothing more than an accident, and the fact that they were almost catatonic with fear. It explained little more than hallucinations caused by the darkness, the cold and panic they must have felt. I will never know what those kids saw, but I know what I saw, what I felt. I know when I found them, they looked like they weren't just scared. They were petrified. So much so, they didn't move from that damp and cold spot to try to find shelter or to get help. They sat there for two whole days, clinging to each other. They saw something. I just wish I knew who, or more likely at this point, what. One of my roles as a park ranger is to help out when we have scouts or any kind of kids group camping out there. As a father, and now grandfather myself, I love being around kids and seeing them enjoying the outdoors, rather than stuck in front of a damn iPad. Of course, there are always health and safety regulations when it comes to the great outdoors. And when you have minors involved, you have to be extra stringent at keeping them safe. We teach them to enjoy, but respect nature, to know what to look out for, seasons to avoid certain areas if animals are looking for a mate, certain animals to avoid altogether, and most important, never ever wander off alone. This particular party of campers was from one of the churches, and the leaders themselves were only kids in my opinion. Luckily. They were good kids, but still, when it came to the evening, I had decided to hang around. Told the kids in charge that I'd be happy to hitch myself up in a hammock and keep watch. They looked at me all wide-eyed and agreed in an instant. Of course, there was nothing really to keep watch for. It wasn't hunting season or breeding. We hadn't had any reports of anything larger than a raccoon snuffling about, but it is always best to be vigilant, especially when you got a whole lot of God's kids to watch over. There should have been nothing to worry about, just a night under the stars, until I saw the eyes. I don't scare easy, you can't in the job, you gotta always have your wits about you. Animals can smell fear. But those eyes, I'll admit, 
I couldn't work out exactly where they were coming from, what they were attached to, and that scared me. They just seemed to be floating in the air over by the trees, just behind the campsite, far away enough that I could make out what sort of body they were attached to, but close enough for me to see they were staring right at me, not moving. The eyes appeared an amber color, and the shape the height of a man. I couldn't move. I had a flashlight and a gun. Safety on, of course, since they were kids. But at that moment, I could have had a machete and an AK-47, and still not even felt remotely safe. I just laid there, staring at those same eyes, wondering what the hell kind of creature could be that tall and have glowing amber eyes like that. I stayed in that same state, frozen in fear, but I like to think, ready to jump if they moved. I nodded off a couple of times, and each time I caught myself. I'd wake with a jerk, and those eyes were still there, watching. Eventually, dawn started to break, and I was just able to make out a silhouette of what most definitely looked man-sized, but they would have had to have been a pro wrestler, or something, because their outline was broad, like some sort of wild barbarian. That was just for a fleeting moment, or two, for as soon as the sun began to rise, along with the sounds of yawning and kids starting to stir, having taken my eyes off the thing for just a second, when I quickly glanced back, it was gone. That was when I finally came to my senses and ran over to see if I could see any trace of anything at all. God knows what I thought I might find. But there was nothing. No evidence or indication that anything had ever been there. Except one small thing. A few feet back into the trees, there were some footprints like nothing I'd ever seen before. They looked like hooves. Just two of them. I'm not exactly sure what stands on hooves, and I don't believe in silly things like werewolves or anything like that. This means that in the science world, there is a very strong possibility that there is a bipedal predator with hooves wandering around these same woods. I think it's amazing in terms of discovery, but as far as having to deal with it, well, that's terrifying. Some unknown species that I've never heard of is out there. The unknown is more apparent than ever. So, this is just a quick story, but I wanted to send this into you regardless, because it's still something that has always stuck with me. Not everybody that visits our park respects them as much as we would like, and unfortunately, we often spend more time clearing up the trash that is left over than much else. One of the worst areas to clean up is actually the river. Well, we call it a river. In reality, it isn't much more than a stream, a creek, deep enough to wade through and for the wildlife to drink, but not much for swimming or fishing. But it did seem to be the favorite spot for people to dump their trash which pissed me off, as the creatures that use it for water don't need to be getting caught up in all that. One day, I was dragging out some garbage. Now, that was obviously by no means unusual. I wear heavy-duty gloves when handling trash, but this one piece of trash piqued my interest for two reasons. One, this bottle appeared to be glass rather than plastic which was worrying, as I didn't want it to smash and have to deal with shards of glass all over. And two, it appeared to have something inside of it. Not something gross, as sometimes I've had to deal with. I swear, people are actually worse than animals on occasion. It looked like as if there was a piece of paper in the bottle. I remember picking it up carefully, where it had lodged itself in the stream. 
and the glass itself looked old, but then it could have just been tainted for being in the water. I sat down and opened the cap and pulled the piece of paper out. I don't exactly know what I was expecting. A pirate treasure map? One of those how far can this message travel notes that kids used to put in bottles or tie into balloons years ago before the internet. What I didn't expect to find were the words help me please, he's keeping me here and I don't want to die. Words written it looked as if in blood. You don't expect to find that every day. I took it back, reported it, and the police took over. They came back and said it was most likely a prank. Someone's sick idea of a joke, but they would continue to look into it, even after not immediately finding anything. I never heard anything more afterwards, so I will never truly know if somebody just got a sick kick and wanted to scare somebody, or if there was really somebody in need of help. Whoever found it, or if that piece of paper really did belong to someone desperate enough to send a cry for help in their own blood, were they ever found? I don't know. I've been in uncomfortable and disturbing situations multiple times in this career choice, and this memory that I just shared with you is probably easily in the top three. Okay, so this is one of the weirdest and creepiest things that I've ever found during my tenure as a ranger. It was an abandoned truck. Now what's so strange about that, you might ask? Maybe it was taken for a joyride. Maybe somebody broke down and went off to get help. All possibilities. Except this truck was totaled. Completely crumpled at the front. So any driver would have been crushed. Upside down too. So it wouldn't have been easy to escape from. I found blood on the driver's seat and the back middle seat. The seat belts were all still plugged in. All five of them. Two in the front, three in the back. No one could have made it out the front. The doors were buckled. The windshield cracked. Yet not enough to indicate that somebody could have been thrown through it or escaped. There was no sunroof. The back doors were still locked from the inside. So what on earth happened? There was zero sign of struggle or bodies found. No one had reported it and it was so far out in the forest that it could have been there for days before I ever spotted it. The only thing that indicated somebody might have managed to escape, although I have no idea how, was a small, near empty wallet a few feet away from the vehicle. The wallet contained no ID or any form of debit cards or payment, although there was about $7 worth of cash in it. It too had bloodstains on it. Of course the police came and examined, towed away anything they could for forensics sake. They were just as baffled as we were as to how anybody could have escaped unless Houdini himself had been in that vehicle. It came back reported as stolen out of state and no match to DNA on the blood. But they concluded that the blood that was in the vehicle was all the same person and the blood found on the wallet and on the dollar bills in the wallet were all again the same blood. So, that's a case that I still think about. This happened roughly eight to nine years ago. I still think about it and I never know exactly what happened. If my memory serves me correctly, I wanna say it was either 2012 or 2013 and I'll never forget, the truck was nearly brand new it was like a 2011, I think. So a nice new souped up truck, totaled far out in the middle of the woods, where there are no roads nearby. How on earth it even found its way out here to the very middle of the barren woods is nobody's guess. If you ever want to hear a tale stranger than fiction, ask a park ranger. My colleagues and I have seen things that would turn your hair white. 
a lot of them end up with some type of boring and everyday explanation once we start looking into it. But then there are those times and cases where the story leaves you scratching your head. And I think this one will be such a story. I'm happy I can share it with you. It was around 9 p.m. one evening, end of the summer, so later August. It was getting dark, but you could still make out where you were going. I was performing my final patrol of the night, driving around to ensure all of our visitors had packed up and left. There was a campground on the other side of the park. This was strictly off limits at nighttime, which meant it was like a mecca for teens who wanted to do some illegal activities. Drinking, sex, camping, debauchery. We weren't expecting to find anybody. It was just a formality before signing off and driving home for a much needed drink with my wife. I was about just as far into the park as I needed to go before turning back and heading back when it happened. My engine cut out completely, as did all the electronics. I remember thinking, being frustrated, this type of thing would happen when I was well beyond walking back distance and when I was almost due to go home. I had no service, so I reached for the radio. Nothing but static. I get out of the van, intending to look under the hood, as best I can in the dark anyway, when I hear a loud humming. When I say loud, it's like I was standing 20 feet away from a high-powered generator. Except this loud humming was coming from the sky. I've got no power, no cell. All batteries in my flashlights, everything I kept around me was dead, which means I have no light. And now, a weird loud humming coming from directly above me. That's when there were two or three flashes of a bright light. Bright enough especially cutting through the darkness that I had to cover my eyes for fear of it blinding me. I never saw anything. No flying saucers, no aliens, no green little men. No men in black. But as soon as that third flash of light had disappeared, so did the humming, instantaneously. And so did the power on the truck, and the headlights, and my battery, and my radio. Everything. It was almost as if there was some bizarre magnetic interference. I could even hear voices of my colleagues as they were signing off too. I looked at my cell and I had full service. I drove back and signed off and went home, thinking about the entire experience all the way back. I never told anybody, not even my wife. I don't know if it was all just some big coincidence or whether I truly experienced a UFO. I don't even know if anything actually happened. Maybe it was some freak magnetic storm. I don't know. Don't the experts say that time stands still and abductees don't even know they've been taken sometimes? All I do know is that I had a headache for days afterwards, a throbbing headache, like my head had been banged around on a floor. Coincidence? I'm curious to see what your opinion is. Thank you for reading. I used to be a park ranger back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Believe me when I say I've seen a handful of creepy things out in the wilderness. But this, this is something else entirely. This wasn't just some old abandoned house or barn that had been taken over or converted by some deranged cultist. This small structure, very hovel in nature, was built for a purpose, it seemed. It had a weird energy surrounding it. It was built for a purpose, it felt, and what purpose is anybody's guess. The weird thing is that I heard voices coming from within this structure. The first time I came upon it, I was curious, thinking it was an old abandoned shack, but like I said, the energy surrounding it felt disturbing. I found nothing of value inside of it, but I began hearing more voices. I couldn't quite make out what the voices sounded like, but it sounded like multiple voices speaking. 
I began hearing these same voices for days afterward, coming and going, haunting me. It was the strangest thing. If we're being honest, I hadn't asked anyone else I worked with because it spooked me so much and I wasn't ready to hear the truth about it. Had anybody else I worked with knew anything about it? It got to the point where I didn't even want to go near the place anymore, unless I absolutely had to. You can see why I might have been reluctant to tell you about it. But now, now I'm telling you all about it. Because if there is any truth to this and what this building is, then it could have possibly something to do with worship or cult practice or some sort of dark history to it. I'm not sure. All I know is, is that when I spent those three years traveling around that park, I would come across it. It would just send shivers down my spine. If I'd even get close to walking around the building, I felt like I was being observed, watched. There was clearly nobody around. There were other weird things too. Strange markings on nearby trees, like carvings. The woods would go silent at random times, only when around this building though. Weird stuff. The building itself was made from old wood, rotting, falling apart, kind of dilapidated. The door was missing, and you could see into the dark interior through the holes. There would be sometimes light and smoke that appeared to be coming from the place. As I said, that place gave me the heebie-jeebies. I felt like I had to warn certain wanderers and hikers about it, or else they would stumble across it and get the same creepy feelings that I did. I just thought I would share this with you. Old places like that out in the middle of nowhere give me the creeps. Then you take into account the weird energy surrounding the place and the feelings of being watched over. I almost wonder if there was some sort of dark thing going on years and years ago before the park was ever developed. I don't know, just thinking about it now just makes me happy that I don't work around there anymore. I was a park ranger, till about eight years ago, where I worked in the Yellowstone National Park. It was one of the most beautiful places I ever saw, and it was my first time there. I remember how it felt to be so close to nature, the wind blowing through the trees, the birds singing, and everything else around me. I never thought that I would get to work in something like this, a place where people can generally camp and hike without any problems. That is, until I had my own experiences in the woods surrounding that park. There is something going on that other rangers refuse to talk about. That's one of the primary reasons I got out of the job field. The other is that I believe the park is cursed. I'm not one to believe in that sort of stuff, but there are a lot of stories about people going into the park and never coming out. The first time I encountered one of these stories was when a father and his young daughter were hiking and got lost in the park. They never turned up, and neither did anybody else that was with them. It wasn't until days later when some other hikers stumbled upon their corpses that the search was called off. Apparently, they had been eaten on by an unknown animal. The conclusion that the animal in question was an unknown predator. It didn't match any DNA on file. The other strange part was this father and daughter were found 13 miles from where they originally went missing. The people that found them did say they heard voices nearby and off in the distance. Strange screaming noises that they couldn't identify. Feelings of being in danger. Over the next few years, cases began happening more and more. People disappearing in the middle of the night, only to be found days and days later, miles away, completely drained of their blood, with their clothing torn to shreds. Sightings of monsters matching the descriptions of big black dogs and giant ape-like creatures. Most people stopped going into the park for a short period of time. This is right around the same time I decided enough was enough and I got out of that job. It was fun and games at first, but then it turned into something much more grim. I knew that being a park ranger wasn't all sugar and rainbows to begin with when I signed up but I didn't realize it would be as dark as it was during my later years. Even the other rangers acknowledged that things were increasingly getting worse, and they weren't sure why. Well, shortly after my departure of the job, I became aware of a book called Missing 411. If you know anything about that book, 
you would know that it is filled with missing person cases, all in the manner which disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Not always in national parks, but many did. To my horror, this made me realize that this is a global issue, and the scope is so much bigger than I ever imagined. They, the Forest Service, is trying their hardest to keep this stuff hush and under wraps. They don't want any of this stuff getting out. It would be complete and total chaos if it did. Now that years have passed, and my knowledge has broadened, as well as my understanding on the issue, it's worse than it's ever been. Having worked in that field myself, I never will set foot in a national park or a national forest ever again. Yeah, you might be safe, but after reading all that, I have to deal with on the job. I don't want to be a statistic and end up in a book. This is a perfect circumstance that it's better to be overly cautious than it is to be reckless and naive. Something is going on and they are not telling people anything. They weren't even telling us. The only thing we got told about was to not tell a soul about what we encountered and saw. And 99% of the time, it was just a missing person or the remains. If you would have told me all about this long before I ever signed up for the job, I wouldn't have believed you. Now that I've lived through it myself and I read about it more, it's more than enough for me to digest. X4 Service Man here. While working for the Fish and Game, I made a lot of close friends, but I still keep in contact with them today. But something happened to me that was far too traumatizing. It forced my hand into quitting the job. I'm going to explain it to you, and although it might not be a huge deal to you, it made me want to stay far away from the new reality that I became a part of. When I first began the job, I had gotten teased plenty of times about seeing Bigfoot and things like that, but the majority of things I ever encountered were not normal, were usually just missing persons. These were disturbing, but it's not like I was seeing portals to other dimensions opening up. Nothing sci-fi. Then, one night, I felt like I walked into a real-life Stephen King movie come to life. While working as a park ranger one night, I was walking down a trail and saw something off in the distance. It looked like a man with wings, but it wasn't human. The creature didn't look like any bird I'd ever seen before. It was black, and it appeared to have a large beak that looked oversized. Its body was human-like, but kind of resembled that of a bat. It had yellow glowing eyes, and they were almost piercing. It had a freaky looking face. It noticed me, and then it just stared at me intently before taking off into the night with an incredible speed behind it, nearly a blur. After that night, I quit my job and never looked back. That was more than enough for me. I decided to move out of the state, but I kept thinking about that thing. Every once in a while, I'd think of a picture of that bird in my head, and I'd get this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I don't know why, but the thought of this thing kept haunting me. I've been living alone for the past few years now. I don't really go outside anymore. I stay inside most of the time. I'm not sure what's going on with me or if it has anything to do with this, but I feel like something is wrong, like something bad is coming soon. I kept hearing strange noises in the woods when I would walk through them long before I ever saw that thing. The entire experience has done something to me. It's changed me for the worse, I feel. It's changed a part of me on the inside and I'm not sure what to do. I've tried talking to people, but no matter how hard I try, they just can't seem to understand me. You are actually the first person I've ever told about what I saw that night. I fear if I try to tell anybody else, like my old colleagues or my family, nobody will believe me. When I first took the job, my biggest fear in the back of my mind is that something like Bigfoot, which I don't believe in any way, would somehow prove its existence to me in the most terrifying way. Although I never saw that, this creature that I witnessed was far worse. My husband has been a park ranger for years now, and he's got a handful of scary things that have happened to him over his time just trying to maintain the park 
and do his job. One that always gets to him is when he was working on a segment of trail, fixing it. I don't recall precisely what he was doing, but he saw a rare sight that you pretty much never see in nature. A pack of wolves. Now, off in the distance, there was a large meadow. At the end of this meadow was a steep hill, littered with sparsely placed fir and oak trees. The wolves, an entire pack of them, were running at high speeds down this hill, then across the meadow. As my husband watched this happen in front of him, he saw that these wolves weren't just running to a destination in mind. They were clearly spooked. Spooked by something. The entire pack, mind you. That's when they were crossing the meadow, and a loud guttural scream came roaring far from the distance from the direction that they had just come from. Few of the wolves in front of the pack nervously turned their heads to look behind them, in the course of the screaming. The scream lasted for a whopping 12 to 14 seconds, my husband had told me. Whatever made the screaming had to have a massive set of lungs. There's nothing out there in the woods that makes that kind of noise. Not to his knowledge. My husband also has extensive wilderness survival training, and knows just about every animal that you can run into out there. He's never heard anything like that scream in his entire life. It scared him more than it scared the wolves that were running from it. I used to work in the Forest Service. I worked as a park ranger for many years and have my fair share of creepy tales and stories. In fact, I could honestly write a book about all my happenings during my time as a ranger but I will leave you with just this one. My story took place in Yellowstone many, many years ago. I will not reveal the exact location because the park is so large, but people in that area have reported at the time strange noises and seeing large shadows moving around. As a park ranger, you have to learn to deflect information with what is real and what is not true. Lots of people see things because they get paranoid when they are outside of their element. It is a natural human occurrence. We had been warning people that the area might not be safe, but there was a couple that decided to not only camp in that area, but camp so far back beyond the trail where they were not allowed. Their tent and belongings were discovered only a few days later, off trail, by hikers. The disturbing part of the story was that they were missing. Their tent and all of their belongings were scattered, bloody, and torn up. It clearly looked like their campsite had been ravaged. It could have possibly been a mountain lion attack, or even a bear. About a quarter mile away from the campsite, we found something. Further away from the trail, we found an unknown and unidentified pile of scat. We weren't able to pinpoint it to a specific animal in the area, but it resembled that of huge dog poop. It did not resemble bear scat or mountain lion scat in any way. Samples were obtained and taken in for analysis. When the tests came back, there were no signs of any human remains in the scat. However, various other remains of animals were in this scat, like small pieces of bone, tissue, etc. Whatever poop it was, it clearly came from a carnivorous animal. If it was waste that came from a wolf, mind you, it was the most considerable wolf droppings I've ever seen in my life. Because this case involved two missing persons, the police had to be called in and an actual investigation followed after. The result of the investigation was that the couple were never found. Even through extensive searching of the area for days afterward, I think this couple even made it into one of David Polite's books, Missing 411, though I'm not too sure. This kind of thing happens far more than you would ever believe. To my knowledge, no bodies were ever recovered. Park Ranger here. Had a terrifying experience back in the fall of 2016, when the whole clown craze was going on. Let me explain. Back in early October, I was scheduled to work on a night shift. For my lookout point, I could see what appeared to be fire from a short distance away. When I went to go investigate, and I could get closer, 
it appeared that it was actually looking like a congregation of people holding torches. What in the hell? Why would there be people out here in the middle of the night? At least 50 of them holding torches in a semicircle. Now, the first thing that came to my mind is some kind of satanic ritual circle. That within itself is far above my pay grade, and I wasn't about to go and try and interrupt that. But, I got a better look at the situation, and to my horror, it was some sort of ritual. What I was looking at was about 60 to 70 people dressed up in clown costumes. I'm talking full makeup and everything. Each one of them holding a torch standing in a loose circle. They weren't talking or doing anything. I don't recall them making any noise whatsoever, just staring off into space or staring off blankly at each other. I ran back to my post immediately and called my boss and told him what was going on. He told me to not hesitate to phone the police if I considered anything to get out of hand. I quickly kept a look on the situation and saw that they were dividing into what looked like groups of two from what I could see and venturing off into the woods, all separately, in every which direction, except the direction where my post was at. I don't know if there's some sort of clown ritual or some sort of cult that meets up and dresses like that, but the experience was weird. This was about 1.45 a.m. in the morning and lasted maybe the entirety of a whole 15 minutes before they all dissipated into groups of two off in the night wilderness. I have no explanation at all for what I saw that night, nor do I know anything about a clown cult. I'm a former park ranger forest service employee. I've spent far too much time out in the forest and have taken away too many awful memories from that career path. I've seen people who have gone out into the woods by themselves and hung themselves. I've seen people who got lost and died of exposure. I've been on search teams where we would go to rescue somebody, and they're not to be found anywhere. The worst is when you encounter missing children, and if you've ever heard or listened to anything about missing children, then you'll know and understand just how awful that is. It's a job that you have to learn to be hardened and put aside your emotions to deal with the task at hand. However, that's in regard to the emotional and traumatic side of things that you deal with on the job. Then, there's an entirely different segment of the job. The segment of the job that puts you in fear and harm's way. It's probably no surprise to you that there are things in the wilderness that we have no idea what or where they came from. I can't sit here and boast to you that I've seen stairs in the middle of the woods. No, nothing like that. No portals, nothing crazy. But that doesn't mean that I haven't spoken with colleagues that have and have had vivid nightmares about things they've witnessed by themselves. For me, I had never truly felt terror until this specific day where I was looking for an individual that had been reported last seen on this trail in an area. He had only been missing for a few hours and I was checking the trail in which he was last seen on. I couldn't help but shake this feeling that something was watching me. At first, I figured it was the lost hiker, and maybe he was trying to get best my attention. I realized quickly that that wasn't the case. This, whatever I was feeling, had an energy to it. A really bad feeling. I could sense it in my stomach. You know how just like when you feel like you're in severe danger, you just have this pit in the bottom of your stomach, like you know something bad is about to take place. That's what I felt. I kept glancing over my shoulder in hopes this lost hiker would step out and show gratitude to me for finding him. Well, that never happened. Instead, I began to see moving shapes around me, hidden behind the trees. Maybe shapes aren't the best terminology to use here. It was more like blurred, opaque figures, if that makes sense. Like something was cloaked. You can't make this stuff up. I was really beginning to freak out. And against my better training and experience out in the woods, I began doing what years and years of training taught me not to do. Panic. I was coming up on a part of the trail where I know I could cut through and get back to the main base area in just a mile. 
The trail I was on looped around, and had I continued on with the trail, it would have taken me much more time to get back. Because I knew the trail so well, and where my location was, I used that to my advantage and cut through the woods to make my way back swiftly. The feeling followed me, and I stopped glancing back over my shoulders to see if these opaque blurred shapes were following me. Instead, I put my full focus on getting back to base and reporting that I did not find an individual. I safely made it back after hauling it like I had since training and trying to keep up with my superiors. The entire experience was nerve-wracking, and the rest of the day, I just felt so off. Drained of energy, as if I had just ran 12 miles and spent the entire day out in the hot, blazing sun. Let me explain this to you. At the time, I was in top physical prime condition. Naturally, I was a machine and walked 20,000 plus steps a day. I kept in great shape, and it took a lot for me to feel as drained as I did. I've not had a day on the job where I felt like this, or remotely close. A measly two and a half mile stroll on a trail like that wasn't going to do that to me. I remember feeling severely dehydrated too. Like whatever was following me zapped me of my energy and hydration. I know fear can do a lot of things to you, but that seemed to be an overkill, drastically. I don't know what things I saw in the woods stalking me, but I felt nothing but bad energy radiating off of these things. I felt like I was a deer being hunted, and then if I stopped for more than a minute, I was done for. I've told several of my colleagues about the same story, and to my horror, they have similar stories with very similar beings, as they call them. Maybe I'll share some of them with you sometime when I get more time to sit down and write it all out. Thanks. I used to live up by the Grand Teton National Park years and years ago, back when all those strange missing person reports were starting to come out. I feel like even being a civilian, I was probably led into some information that I probably shouldn't know about. Having friends who work the Forest Service and local law enforcement, and among other places in my family. I felt like I had an advantage of knowing things that other people probably didn't know about. I'm not trying to sit here and boast and say I have top level clearance when it comes to knowledge, but I've heard talking. And I've also had a chance to read David Polite's Missing 411 book, which kind of just coincides with a lot of the things that are going on, especially around the Grand Teton National Park area. Trust me, right out. The information is disturbing at best. And if missing persons aren't disturbing enough, it's the manner in which they disappear, and the things that I've heard circulating are even more disturbing. Any information I reveal to you, I will not reveal the identity of whom the individual I got it from, and I will keep their identity anonymous as to protect them. Not that I have anything mind-blowing, but it's definitely more than a civilian should know about. Which brings me to my first topic. I don't know how much you know about dogmen and cryptids in general, even though you read a bunch of stories on them, so I'll just throw this at you. Up here in the Yellowstone area, and all the way down to the Grand Teton, we have these things called buffalo wolves. The name says it all. These are wolves that are probably close to three times the size of a normal wolf. And not only do they ride in a pack, but they also will walk up on their hind legs. I've been told by Forest Service specifically, they can kind of resemble a werewolf. They are tactful, strategic, very intelligent, and very hostile, while many consider them to be a cryptid and don't exist. It's more than enough proof for some of my close friends who have to deal with their messes. Not too long ago, one of these things killed about three wolves from a neighboring wolf pack. We believe it was a tack that was all territorial based, but we don't really know. I was given very little insight to the gruesome scene of coming upon three dead wolf bodies ripped into pieces. If that's not enough proof for you that something more is out there doing this, then I don't know what to tell you. There's no known natural animal that can tear three wolves to pieces like that. Bears, yeah, but bears don't do that or act like that. And if you want to break down the science of it, 
Bears and wolves have survived in the wild together. They don't compete for the same food, and while bears are slower and much more powerful, wolves are more agile, and they know that bears can take them down. So wolves don't really ever mess with bears. And if there are ever circumstances in the wild, which I'm sure there have been, where bears and wolves have had some sort of standoff, I guarantee you it would not look like this. Three wolves, mutilated, ripped into pieces, with no trace of blood or anything from an opposing predator. I'm sorry, but even as a skeptic, there is no known predator or creature that rips wolves into pieces. It is widely speculated by Forest Service that these buffalo wolves are a huge reason that there are such a thing as missing persons. There has yet to be definitive proof, like pictures or any other sort of evidence, but from what I'm told, the entire area is a giant breeding ground for these wolves. If you know anything about the missing 411 books, which I'm going to assume you don't, you'll know that people have gone missing all over the country under weird and strange circumstances. Personally, I can't attribute all of that to these buffalo wolves, but something is going on. All I can speculate from my area is that I strongly believe it is these creatures. Of course, there lacks proper evidence and proof. And then that's when you get into a very strange phenomenon, like only finding one shoe, or one article of clothing, or they'll find the person's body, completely intact and unscathed, and appear to have died from exposure. Those kinds of things I can't properly summarize because I don't know. I do believe that if it is a buffalo wolf, they are just outright killing and eating people with no questions asked. I know there is a massive population of deer and other various wild game, but I try to think in my head of how much meat that it takes a day to feed a five, 600 pound meat eating predator. Because of every time that I've ever been told about these things, it's always just been how big they are and how massive they are from their head down to their bodies, and me not ever having seen one is hard to fathom, considering wolves are already pretty big, so I'm trying to imagine a super predator three times the size, living in packs out in the wild. Now, the second thing I want to mention is their dens. It's believed that these things are living underground, or possibly carved into the mountainside in deep cavern systems. Wherever the pack resides, it's not out in the open. Because it's believed that these beings are far more intelligent and possess some humanoid quality to them, they stay in the far outer reaches of the wilderness, shrouded in mystery. And from what I know, there's only been a real handful of sightings from park rangers and law enforcement. Even their face-to-face -face encounters are scarce and far and few in between. Along with some of the missing person files they have, and the bodies they do eventually find that are unscathed and untouched and just seem to have died of exposure. There are the other small percentage of bodies that they find, well, not in the best of conditions, if you know what I mean. I'll spare you the bloody and gory details, but long story short, they weren't found in one whole piece. After coroners have had ample time to test the bodies for all things DNA, study the manner in which they were attacked and killed, or from what little remains they could even gather of what's left of the person. There doesn't seem to be any DNA evidence to support that they were attacked and killed by a bear, or even a pack of wolves, but rather something else entirely. What exactly seems to be the grand circulating question that nobody can come up with an accurate answer for? Empty hypotheses and skepticism are continuously thrown around and circulated, but no physical answers. It forces you to see the grim reality, that camping just isn't as safe as they claim it to be. If word got out to the public that these kinds of things were going on as often as they are, from not only the park ranger service, but from the law enforcement officials, well, you would have complete chaos and panic. Parks would lose substantial revenue, and the forest service would take a massive hit. And then there are those enough who are fortunate enough to be informed by knowing the right people and those of us who can make the right decisions based on what's really going on. Sightings, encounters, and quote-unquote happenings have been increasing exponentially in the past 20 to 30 years. It's strongly believed that their population is growing substantially, and because there's so little data and availability to properly study these creatures, nobody is really sure why. One of the massive repercussions of their population substantially growing like it is as they start moving out to more urban populated areas, 
Next thing you know, you're hearing left and right from people reportedly seeing werewolves, as they call them, in populated cities, suburban areas, and even more. It'll start with the homeless population, since they're a very easy target and often go to areas that are more secluded and in the dark. When they go missing or get eaten, attacked, what have you, no one really cares because, well, they were homeless and likely didn't have really any attachments to anybody or anything. In fact, the homeless population might even act as an easy target for them, since it's pretty much free food, assuming they are moving out towards the urban areas and targeting homeless people. But if what I have to say turns out to be true, you'll start seeing the homeless individual population decrease. Sure, in major areas like Skid Row, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, the numbers are skyrocketing. But try traveling out to areas that are a little more rural, where there are much more thicker forests and places to hide. For the homeless, these are some of the best places because it allows you places to hide, be secluded, and set up your own camp without ever being bothered. But at the same time, you run the risk of other things. The other thing to think about too is when you see an empty homeless camp, you don't ever think really where they are, and no one really cares if you think about it. If they're gone, they're gone, and their homeless tent is all that remains. No one's ever going to ask questions or find them. In turn, that means these creatures can continue to feed freely. They can expand and grow, and their population can push out even more into urban areas. Yeah. What I'm saying is possible that this is all just whack conspiracy theory, but you think a 500, 600 pound, 700 pound predator has to eat something and there's only so many deer around in a certain area. This is also the same reason why cats and dogs go missing in neighborhoods that these things frequent. You see it all over the place. It is very common. Unfortunately, we'll never get people to officially tell us what's going on. So we just have to rely on ourselves and take heed and caution on our own. I'm not saying you should avoid national parks, I'm saying you should go into them very cautiously, being highly acute to every inch of your surroundings because you can never let your guard down for too long. And the real kicker here is that not everybody goes missing, but do you really want to be part of the percentage that does? Assuming that these creatures are highly intelligent and masters of camouflage, I just feel like entering these national parks is a huge risk, and those feelings are strongly supported by my park ranger and law enforcement official friends. I really worry about the COVID-19 pandemic and everything being shut down, like national parks and people not being out, because that means these things are gonna start exploring more and more, entering into suburban neighborhoods, looking more for food, more than ever. Keep an eye out and be vigilant, because there's no telling where you might see one of these things. I work in the outdoor field and lead trips regularly. I once led a trip to the top of Mount Sterling in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top, about six miles from the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor. We were camping out on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other co-instructor went to bed in their tents. I chose to spend the night in a hammock. I was really into a book I was reading, so I stayed up and read until about 10.30 p.m. I turned my headlamp off to settle in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the moon, and from the position I was in, I could see down the trail we had hiked to get to the top. I laid there, enjoying the scenery, and noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in the area, so I perked up. As it got closer, I could tell it was a person. We were in the middle of nowhere, and there was somebody hiking up the trail with no headlamp on or any gear. I was just frozen, watching this person move closer to our camp. They arrived at the top of the mountain, where we were, and just stopped. I watched as what appeared to be a man surveying our camp. I really could only see the outline of him, he stood there for what seemed like 30 minutes, but may have been 10. He then turned, sat down under a tree facing our camp. 
He was sitting up in a way that I knew he wasn't trying to sleep. He just sat there, staring at our camp. I had no idea what to do, so I decided to wait it out. I waited, just staring at the man while he stared at my camp. This went on till about 3.30 a.m. Then, he stood up, took a moment to survey my camp a few minutes longer, and then went back down the trail he came upon. I, to this day, have no idea what that was all about, but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip. A couple of years ago, I went camping with my brother and old roommate of mine. This was in one of the national forests in Oregon. We were pretty high up, kind of near an old ghost town. Not really a dangerous area, but there are a lot of black bears and some cougars. I set up my hammock with the tarp draped over to keep the rain out. Then, I got pretty drunk and went to bed. Well, since I drank my weight in beer, I woke up in the middle of the night and had to pee. I lifted up the tarp to peek out with a flashlight, and that's when I saw two eyes staring back at me. They were about 20 feet away. I was using one of those stupid $2 hardware store LED lights, so it didn't throw a beam so I couldn't see what was behind the eyes. All I could see was that they were far apart. My first instinct was to turn off the light and stay where I was. But it was so close, and that I wouldn't be able to see it. We had three guns, but I left mine in the truck. I came to the conclusion that the only thing to do was to stay perfectly still and keep the light on so I could see it. So, I draped my other leg out of the hammock and was ready to bolt for the truck if it charged me. I stayed in this position for what felt like forever until I noticed that the eyes had not moved at all. So I took a chance. I slowly got out of the hammock and began moving around the eyes, keeping about 20 feet between us. I was moving towards the truck. Once I got to the side, I saw it. It was a pair of binoculars, left open sitting on a stump. With a light, they reflected just like a pair of eyes, and in my half-drunk state, it never occurred to me that this could possibly be it. I put the binoculars away and went to sleep. I know that this isn't actually a dangerous experience. I've actually encountered wild animals before, but this is by far the most scared I've ever been, and for the most amount of time, of course. I'm a seasonal ranger for my local forest district. Despite the fact that I live in a fairly suburban area, the forest preserves still make up about 12% of the county, with much of the property being heavily wooded. Not far out wilderness, but pretty secluded in some areas. Being a seasonal employee, I've been on the job for a bit over a month now, but in my short time here, I've found three things. Number one, a dead man in a tree. The rest of the rangers say they find about one suicide a year, so here was the one for the year. When we go around opening parks each day, we drive through to make sure everything is okay. In this instance, I was driving through and had just lost sight of the road when I saw a man hanging from a tree in a clearing. He had hung himself. I called the cops and the coroner. Friggin' coroner took an hour to show up, and he was the only one with the ladder long enough to cut the guy down. So I stared at a dead guy in a tree for about an hour. Number two, crazed, drugged up, naked man running around a parking lot. Took me and three other rangers to catch the guy. And when we finally caught him, found out he had multiple cuts across his body from running through brush and rock lodged firmly up his, well, I'll let you guess. Number three, headless deer. Normally, when a pack of coyotes take down a deer, yes, we have a bunch of coyotes around here, they leave bite marks all over the body, along with torn off flesh everywhere. But the head was cleanly sliced off and placed directly next to the body, meaning this is something created by human intervention. We still haven't figured out that one yet, and I've only been on the job for five weeks.
I live in Northeast Oklahoma, and I consider myself a camping and fishing enthusiast. One spring night, me and two friends decided to go fishing. It's around midnight, and we're going to a place that was once a maintained primitive camping area. This is not a remote location, but it's not very well known either. As we approach the turnoff for our spot, we see another vehicle slowly turning out off of it and proceeding in the way in which we came. We pass them, and a friend says how he figured no one else would be around. We get to our spot, get our gear out, and begin to prepare. But as we chat, drink a few beers, we all notice an unspoken easiness. Something is just not right. Usually, I'm a trooper, fishing until the sun comes up, but I'm the first to crack. I explain to my friends how I feel, that we should leave and I just have a bad feeling. They agree. We load up. While slowly driving through the old campground, we notice some brightly glowing embers in an area where nobody has been. My friend driving stops without even thinking and goes for a look. He is startled, telling us to come see. What we saw was the remains of three crosses, made of wood that would stand about 12 inches if upright. But they had been burned, along with a small campfire. And to make it even better, all were lying on freshly turned soil, which resembled a freshly dug grave. We freaked, got the hell out of there fast. Thank you, sweet baby Jesus. We are home free, we all thought. When we approached the exit of the old campground, we noticed a vehicle parked on the side of the road. We passed it, and we all realize it's the same car we passed on the way in. There was nobody in the car. They had doubled back and were likely watching us, waiting to do who knows what. Not a pro, but more than a thousand days in the backcountry over the past decade. I have always been drawn to the wild. It seems like home and I generally know my neighbors out there. Not afraid to be in the deep woods, in the dark. I love my woods. One sunny weekend afternoon, I had dirt biked up an old mining road. It gained a couple thousand feet from the valley floor towards one of the ridges of the Cascades. When the road gave out near the bottom of a high basin, I put my backpack and started off cross country toward the ridge. It was still heavily forested, old growth and old cut fading in another thousand feet into those scraggly windblown ones near the top. About 20 minutes in, and about a half mile up from me, near the tree line, I heard this thumping sound. It was very odd, so I stopped to listen carefully. It sounded like a big, solid branch was being whacked against a solid tree. I used the term solid because the hits were powerful. One or both of the pieces of wood were hard and dry. The wood resonated and rang on impact as dry wood will. I couldn't get over the power though. It sounded like somebody was swinging a four inch post. Weird, right? Well, it gets better. This someone sounded like they were trying to communicate. The thumping had a very complex and well-defined pattern. And here's the weirdest part. The thumping signal occasionally became very rapid, like what a drummer could do if they were noodling around with a stick. But I swear, it sounded like a four-inch post was being treated as lightly as a drumstick. I listened for maybe five minutes, just fascinated with the sound, this code and the power of it. Then, the drumming suddenly stopped, and I kind of woke up to the fear of this unknown thing out there. I had my pistol, I had my bear spray, and my knife. I really only fear cougars, and even then, I figured they'll have a bad day trying to take me down. Still, the silence as I stared into the forest ahead seemed loaded, and I turned on my heels and left that valley. That place and that experience just gave me the chills, and that high valley won't ever see my shadow again. I have read stories about some of the native people around here having valleys that they just wouldn't go into. 
I can now easily understand how these legends get started. Back in the late 90s, a lady was said to have committed suicide on a portion of highway that borders a swamp-like area, crashing into an oncoming car. I don't know if her suicide has anything to do with my sighting, but the fact that the two coincide together just makes my skin crawl. In place of her death, or the part of her road that she shot off and died, is a memorial. You know, one of those typical sides of the road white crosses adorned in flowers and other memorial based items. Well, because of my work, I have to drive this two lane highway every day to and from. I've been very fortunate in these times of COVID-19 that my work has actually been steady. In fact, my workload has actually doubled, if not tripled. And so because of that, I've been very fortunate in these times of COVID-19 that my work has actually doubled, if not tripled, because of other people being laid off and me being kept on. I want to keep what I do anonymous, so I'll leave it at that. But I'll just say that I help businesses create revenue and bring in more clients. Anyway, I was coming back in the evening time. Keep in mind that because it's spring and summer, it doesn't get dark out till super late. So at this point, the sun was just starting to go down but it was still bright outside. I'm coming up the hill, getting ready to turn, and the lady's memorial is right there on the side of the road. Well, as I'm coming up, my headlights, which by the way I keep on 24 seven, because I prefer to practice good driving, they reflected these two lights to the side of the road, directly to my right where the memorial is. Because the reflection of light caught my eye, out of reaction, I look over, and I see this lizard looking thing on two legs that's looking right at me and my car. What exactly was I looking at? I'm not sure. Was I seeing a real life alien? Was this somebody in a convincing costume that didn't get the memo that it was not yet Halloween? It had a look on its face like, oh crap, I've been spotted. And I went from doing 45 miles an hour to a slow 15, mouth agape and all. I didn't expect to see whatever this was. It looked to maybe be four to five feet tall with a long tail that drug behind it. I thought it was a person in a costume again, but it looked to be just like a lizard man, a real life lizard man. It was really ugly too. After staring at me for a couple of seconds, as I'm passing, it turns around and jumps right back into the trees where it came from. The longer I spent looking at it, the more I came to the conclusion, more and more, that this was a real animal. If it was a costume, by any stretch of the means, then it was a Hollywood tear, makeup and acting job. Why would anybody be out here on the side of the highway dressed up like that? I know people do crazy stuff, especially in this day and age with YouTube and everybody wanting views and fame, but it just seemed to be too far-fetched for me, and this thing looked far too animalistic to be a person. I didn't want to believe that of course, I wanted to believe it was actually a person. I saw what I saw, and I cannot argue with myself and say that this did not look animalistic. Even the look in its eye had that wild animal look. So afterwards, I called up my wife immediately and told her what I saw. Because well, her and I tell each other everything, no matter how crazy. I told her that I was worried, and that I wasn't getting enough sleep and that I was starting to have visions. What I saw didn't look like a vision though. It looked like a real flesh and blood living being. It looked intelligent and it looked very much kind of like a human does. The stature, the way it carried itself when it walked, everything. It's kept me up at night, that's for sure. And the next few days and evenings when I would drive past that memorial spot, I kept looking for this thing to see if I could see what I saw I never did see it again, and I have no idea what it was that I did see. I'm not even sure how to wrap my mind around it, because it is just so left field for me. It didn't look like a monster, but maybe a lizard that was exposed to radioactivity. That became part human, or mutant, or something. I know I'm venturing into the realm of comic book reality here, but the thought of it is just so out of the realm of normal. 
I can't even come up with words to accurately put a picture of what I saw. It was a human reptile that walked just like a man and acted like a man. I find the term lizard man to be the best way to accurately describe this thing. In my earlier 20s, I was an outdoor junkie. I traveled all over the northern United States and even many parts in Canada to see as much as I could. My whole ideology is that life is so short, I don't want to miss what this beautiful earth has to offer me. I had just gotten out of a very toxic relationship for four years with a girl that I probably should have never dated, and to put it lightly, the breakup devastated me. So. I wanted to turn my life around and give my time and energy towards being out in nature. That's what really sparked this whole incident. Had none of that ever happened, I wouldn't have had my sightings as I did, and I certainly wouldn't have been at the Algonquin Provincial Park that day. To make a long story short, I sold everything I had, pretty much lived for hitchhiking and walking everywhere I went. It sounds crazy, but emotional turmoil will make you do crazy things, and I wanted to remedy my pain with nature instead of substances and alcohol and things that would make me feel empty. Anyway, enough talk of broken hearts and trying to heal. Let's get on to what happened. I had a sighting of a reptilian-like creature at Algonquin Park in Ontario five years ago. I was hiking by myself, and I came to the end of one of this trail. To the right, the trail curves, but there's a sudden drop off. If you were to fall, it's about a 50 to 60 foot drop. As I'm approaching this drop off, and before I can even see down, I hear commotion, like something big moving around. At first, I get excited because I think maybe I'm about to see a large bear or something. But I look down, and I see this large reptilian thing running on all fours off into the woods. I had to double take because my head, I'm thinking, what am I seeing? I wasn't high, I was not drunk and I certainly was not on acid. I was sober as a honeybee. I was also the only one around because I did a lot of hikes by myself. I looked around to see if there's anybody else around me that I can motion to ask, did you see that too? Unfortunately, I was the only person around me. I stood there. Looking out over the small drop off into the canyon below, if you could even call it a canyon. About a few minutes later, an older man comes walking up the trail and smiles at me and greets me with a friendly hello. I turn to respond to him, but ask him if he's ever seen anything weird up here. He politely says no, and you could tell by the look on his face that he isn't quite sure what I was getting at. I pointed down at the drop off and said I just saw this weird reptile creature running on all fours like an animal down there and I wanted to know if you have ever seen such a thing. He shook his head and continued on with his hike. Now I was struggling with reality. Did I really see that? Well, I let it go in the moment and I continued on with my hike. Fast forward years later. And I'm telling my friend about it because we got on the topic of seeing strange animals and he was telling me about his Bigfoot sighting that he had had. I don't believe in Bigfoot or really anything that challenges the realm of reality that we live in, but I can't refute my experience and so I was telling him about what happened to me. He told me that I should go check out this YouTube channel called What Lurks Beneath and that I should submit my story to you. Well, I checked out your channel and I was blown away to find that you had a series, an entire series at that, dedicated to just reptilian cryptid creatures. I learned so much in just spending a few hours listening to these encounters back to back. Crocodilian men, Komodo dragon-like people, very similar to what some of the creatures that I saw. I guess I'm not crazy after all, and I'm obviously not the only person seeing these types of creatures. Unlike a lot of the encounters you feature on your episodes, mine didn't happen anywhere close to a swamp, to my knowledge, but it did happen out in the open. Then, my story gets even weirder. Before I actually wrote up my story and sent it to you, I learned about these large mounds that apparently reptilians are drawn to 
and I didn't even know if they lived underground or not, or if they lived in these mounds, but they seemed to be in all these reptilian stories. Well, I reached out to a couple of my friends who have frequently hiked in the Algonquin Provincial Park. I don't know why I didn't think to do this initially when I had my sighting. I reached out to them and asked if they had ever found anything weird in their journey traversing to the park and hiking. This is where my jaw hit the floor. One friend of mine was telling me, which by the way he's a very experienced outdoorsman, but doesn't know anything about cryptids or certainly reptilians. He discovered what he found were really large mounds, about 9 feet tall, just roughly 6.5 miles off trail. I couldn't believe what he was telling me. This was after I listened to several of your reptilian episodes, and I immediately put the two together. I can't believe what I had heard. I had to sit down and process everything all these years later to realize that this was reality, and I actually saw a reptilian being. I never would have thought in a million years they existed, let alone resided in the Algonquin Provincial Park. <laughs> 